energy as he does. It's kind of sprightly. For an old fellow, you really are. But it's good to have them with us. Lord, bless you this morning and welcome to Calvary. It's good to have them back after all these years, huh? But this is a special place for me. So, forgive me for getting a little emotional. It'll clear up in a minute. But this is a special place. I was uh, 17 when we came here from the South of England, March of 1969. My mother and father. That's what I'm going to March. March. I believe we arrived here around the 21st of March. 26th. When was your birthday? 26th. 26th. So it might have been the 26th. Could it be? Could have been. I don't remember. But <clears throat> we were here for a few months, and my dad saw this housing unit across the street, which is still here today. And so he said that he felt that God had inspired him that there should be the church here because we were meeting in a wooden Grange Hall at the time. So at that point, the uh, person who was the secretary and treasurer of the small group that was meeting his name was Eric Bowie, and he was a chemist here in Elgin. He used to ride up around the Elgin on a bicycle. So at, uh, at that point in time, he, my dad told him about this piece of land across the street from the housing unit, and so he said, uh, you'll never get it because this property belongs to the Laird of Pitgaveney the Laird of Pitgate. And so this was the summer of 1969, and my dad was a very, very um, nice man, but he was also pretty stubborn. Whenever he got an idea in his head, he figured, well, we're gonna make it happen. So he contacted the property manager uh, at Pitgate, and the good Laird agreed to meet with us. And so my mother and I and my dad went up to the, to the Laird, and he came down the stairs in full regalia. <laughs> and the, the whole deal, the kilt, he had the sash, he had the, the sparn, he had the dirk. He was just a grand sight, an amazing sight. So whenever he greeted us into his lovely home, we sat down in front of him. And he asked my dad to explain the reason why he was there. And uh, when my dad got to talking to him, he said, well, you seem like a nice man, Mr. Campbell, and he said, uh, I like your wife. <laughs> and he said, who's this young whippersnapper over here? And he said, well, that's my son, Gordon. So he said, continue on. So my dad began to tell him the vision that he had for having a church building here. And so the Laird said to him, Mr. Campbell, we have never as a family sold any of our property off in the history of our family, and we're probably not going to do it. But I like you, and I like your story. And he said, I like your wife. <laughs> you see? So, ladies, don't underestimate the power that you have. <laughs> and he turned around, and we're sitting there, the three of us, we're sitting on the edge of our seat because this great room that we were in had all kinds of trophies. This man was a great hunter. And so he had all kinds of trophies. He had uh, animals that I can't even remember, but they, they were dressed and presented around the hall. And I'm sitting there in absolute amazement. He looked at my dad and he says, Mr. Campbell, I'm gonna sell you the land. Mm -hmm. For a hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> build your church. And yesterday, 
we went over to South Gilbert Street where this book was written, which I'll talk about a little later. Found the, uh, went up, knocked on the door. The lady that uh, answered the door thought we were salespeople or missionaries or something. She was reluctant to let us in because she was on a phone with her friend. And she says, um, she said, who's this at the bottom of the stairs? I said, my wife, Lori Campbell. Campbell, come in, come in. She said, when she got off the phone, she said, she said, and what's your name? I said, my name is Gordon Campbell. She said, well, she said, my mother and father bought this house from you folk whenever you left in 1974. So I told her the story of the Laird that Pitt gave me, and she said, did the Laird ever see the church built? And of course, the church was built in the latter part of 1970, and it was opened in February of 1971. So we met with the Laird in the, even, the, the summer of 1969, and he passed away in December of 1969. Mm -hmm. So he never got to see the church, but he did get to meet my mother. <laughs> and that cheered him up pretty good. So our background in this area was an amazing miracle. Yeah. And it is an amazing miracle to me after all these years because 50 years ago in September, I left Elgin to go to America. And for some reason, people tell me that I lost my British accent. <clears throat> but it's been 50 years. <laughs> so some people pick it up a little bit here and there, especially over, over in America. I've had a couple of people, because I was originally born in Northern Ireland. And so I had a lot of, my family was born in Northern Ireland. We're from Belfast. So some people, whenever I've talked or going to a shop or whatever, I've had several people that have stopped me and said, you sound like Liam Neeson. <laughs> I said, really? Well, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> interesting stuff. But in any event, we're very happy to be here. My wife is doing a wonderful job right now. We've got some folks in the United States that are interested in what we're doing here. Uh, in the United Kingdom. They're kind of scratching their head why we came over five months ago. But we just felt that we should come over here. And an interesting thing is that my mother, who used to play the piano here and the organ in the church, while well, she's still living in uh, Wolverhampton, and she just turned 91 now, so she sends her greetings to the church in Elgin because she, she was here and she actually worked for a time at uh, Johnson's of Elkin, um, worked there for, for some time. <clears throat> uh, that, was, that was pretty amazing. So anyway, we're very glad to be here. We are very happy to be here with all of you. It's so nice to see you and meet you. It's also very nice for us to be here with the Fife family. We are thrilled that they're here. It's, a, it's an amazing thing that uh, I was, I was in prayer in Richmond, Virginia, and um, I was just felt very, very strongly that, excuse me a second, I, I felt strongly that it was, it was about time after all these years. Now, I realized that the church was started by somebody from Northern Ireland, but I figured that it was about time after all these years that we had a Scot here. And, uh, you know, I think it's Mark to have a Scott here. So we welcomed Derek, Regina, Kara, Soraya, and Elena to our home in Elkin. And we're glad Ashton's here as well. And we're glad to see Paul Goodall. You know, his wife was back, when I came back from uh, America in 1973 and stayed here for three years, his wife was just a young girl going to the Elgin Church. So it's interesting how time just kind of moves along. And here we are, after all these years. And to see you folks here today is just an amazing blessing for us and an amazing miracle from God. 
because God's really good. That's one of the things I figured out over the journey that I've taken. And I don't know if I need this or not. I don't know if you can hear me all right. I don't know if I need this. Sometimes I get to have a little bit of a, a booming voice, so I may not need this. But, you know, what I've discovered is that God is very good. And I want to just encourage you today to realize that there is more going on with this church and the ministry of this church in our present world than you can even imagine. You come along and you sing and you praise the Lord and you wonder, God, what are you doing with us? What are we doing here? But there is something going on. God cannot be stopped. Yes. It doesn't matter what people say, what people think. God can't be stopped. He is constantly at work. And he is doing an amazing thing in the world right now as a result of Elgin Moray Stop. And you'll be surprised. I really believe that. It is no accident that we're here. My wife, 37 and a half year veteran nurse, just retired a year ago. <clears throat> I was in the car business in the United States for 35 and a half years. I retired seven years ago, and so it was very gracious of Pastor Fife to say that I had ener more energy than he thought I would have, and I'm excited about that because God's got a lot of work for me to do, and, you know, it's important for me to have that energy level so that I can just keep going. At 68 years old, I'm just happy to be uh, awake this morning. <laughs> I'm very grateful. I'm excited. <laughs> And so we're thrilled to be here. Isn't that right, Lord? Yes. Amen. Would you like to greet these folks and just say something? Lori's taping this. So we'll yes, just so that's, that's fine. <clears throat> so to start off what we're talking about this morning, I'd like to see if you would be kind enough to turn to your Bibles. And we're going to read several scriptures. If if uh, we can do that. And we're going to start this off with a, what I consider to be my favorite scripture. Do we have any extra any extra Bibles around that we can... Uh, I'll put them up on the screen. Huh? I'll set the scriptures up on the screen. Oh, okay. You're going to put them right up here? <laughs> Isn't this amazing? <laughs> Isn't it Your amazing? dad would have been amazed. My dad would have been amazed. He <laughs> loved technology. Here's the count. I, if I drift off a little bit this today, it's not, I'm going to say this morning, but it's past that already. Do I have your permission to drift off just a little bit into a little, just a little bit? Maybe not a lot, but a little bit. Interestingly enough, whenever I was a little boy in Belfast, in I was born in 51, so I'm going to say I was about three years old. On our street, which was Glen Till Street in Belfast, my dad bought the first television. So we had it set up in the house, and people would walk by the front window, and we had a, a group of people that would stand there and watch and see what was the next show that was coming on the TV in 1954. So he loved technology. So the first scripture we're going to read is my what I consider to be my favorite scripture of all time. And that is John, the book of John, chapter 13, verse 35. And this side kind of sets the stage for what we're doing here today in and, and this. John 13, 35. John 13, 35 says very simply, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love one to another. 
Now, there's a lot of people that have come up with a lot of different things about what is it that identifies us as believers and Christians. But I, at this point in time in my life, I just like to cock my ear to the Lord and just let him tell me what he considers to be a trademark for me to be identified as his believer. But the important part of the scripture as well is that thought. Look at this. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. My disciples. So my thought today is very simply this. Who is he? Who is he? If it's my disciples, not our disciples, not their disciples, it's my disciples. That indicates one person. That indicates one person. You're my disciples. So at that point in time, there are some that are going to feel left out. Unless, let's turn to the next scripture, which let's find out what the Old Testament says about who he is. Isaiah 9 and 6. Isaiah 9 and 6. Wow. Who is he? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now we're approaching Christmas, aren't we? Coming up to Christmas. For unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He's got it all covered. He's got it all covered. Who is he? Well... Let's find out what it says in the New Testament about it. Let's look at the next scripture, which is Revelation chapter 22, verse 12 and 13. Who is he? My disciples. Who is he? And behold, I come quickly. Not them, not us, but I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. So who is he? I am the Alpha. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Very interesting. How about that famous book that we all like to quote from time to time? The book of Acts. This kind of clears up and helps us to understand who is coming back. Who is coming back? Mm -hmm. Acts chapter 1, verse 9 through 11 and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So they're not coming back. He is coming back. He is coming back. Very simply. Who is he? 
Matthew chapter 8, verse 23 through 27. And this is running a close second for me to, to John chapter 13 because this just is an amazing group of verses for me. Matthew 8, 23 through 27. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. Because he was a man. He was a man. So he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. They were scared. They were frightened for their lives. The storm was incredible. These were professional fishermen. They knew the difference between a light breeze and a big storm. <laughs> they had been through this before, so they knew. And probably some of their chums had lost their lives as a result of storms like this that came through and bashed those boats. So they were not amateurs. These were professional fishermen that he had recruited as to be his disciples. And behold, there rose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose, and he rebuked the winds and the sea. There was great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this? That even the winds and the sea obey him. Who is he? We call him Jesus. That's who we call him. Mm -hmm. We sang about him. Mm -hmm. We lifted our hands. We clapped our hands. We skillfully played the drums. We skillfully played the keyboards. Skillfully sang on praises unto the Lord. We lifted up the name of Jesus. And that's a marvelous thing. And it's even more marvelous when we realize who he is. At that moment, can you see this so simply? is the fact that that moment he identified himself to his disciples and let them see who he is. He is the God man. For one minute he's sleeping and the next minute he's speaking to his creation. He's speaking to his creation. The winds knew who he was. The waves knew who he was. Mm -hmm. They immediately obeyed their master, their creator. They immediately the, obeyed the one that spoke them into existence. They knew who he was. So if the winds know who he is, if the waves know who he is, isn't it important that when we're lifting up our hands in praise and worship and clapping and praying, you know, I think it's wonderful that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. And it's so exhilarating to me whenever I begin to pray the way the disciples prayed and I understand who I'm praying to because he said, when you pray, pray our Father. Our Father. Our Father. Some people I know didn't, weren't as fortunate as I was to have the father I had. Mm -hmm. I am deeply grateful to God for the father that I had as an example to me. Mm -hmm. He passed away at 53 years old. God took him. He was gone in 1981. 
I dropped him off at JFK Airport. He got on the plane, died on the plane. But I am grateful for the father that I have. The teaching that he instilled in me as a little boy. It's an honor for me to be here celebrating his life, celebrating his work. But it is a greater honor for me to be here to celebrate my Heavenly Father. Mm -hmm. My yes. Heavenly yes. Father. Yes. Our Father who mm -hmm. art in mm -hmm. heaven, mm -hmm. hallowed be thy name. Mm -hmm. Thy kingdom come. Mm -hmm. Thy will be done mm -hmm. on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespass, as we forgive those that trespass against us. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Forever and ever. World without end. Forever and ever. Amen. We have got to know who he is to be able to properly praise him, to properly lift him up, to properly worship him, to properly love him. Mm -hmm. Because after all, he's our father. Mm -hmm. And when those winds and waves were playing around a little bit, these girls are playing around. They're having so much fun the last couple of days. They're just playing around. They're having fun together. But you know what? You know, the winds and the waves, they're God's kids. They're God's kids. They are. He created them. And so they were misbehaving. And they, he said to them, he said, knock it off. You're scaring my chums. <laughs> knock it off. You're not, this is not the time for that. Calm down. And they were like, yes, Lord. Because we know who you are. Mm -hmm. We know who you are. Mm -hmm. You are the great I am. You are the everlasting Father. Mm -hmm. You are the Prince of Peace. You are the great eternal wonder. You are the, the God of the universe. You spoke these worlds that we enjoy and we live in. You spoke them into existence. And then, and then, that brings us to this scripture, which is leading us up to what's Elgin doing in the world today right from this church? Right from this church. This scripture is a powerful scripture because it just kind of crystallizes everything we've just been talking about. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. And I can't read verse 9 without reading verse 10. I have to read them both. Is this a bottle of water I could take a little yeah, straight off? Do you mind, folks? I'm, I <laughs> wish I could share it with you, but... I'd love to share it, but I can't. <clears throat> Let's look at this. Can we look at this? Mm -hmm. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. And there's verse 9. This is, means a lot to me. You'll see why in just a minute. For in him, I think we all agree that this is, Paul is referring to our best friend. I know he's my best friend. Look, Lori and I are, we're, we're you know, we, we say that we're joined at the hip. We, we go everywhere together. And I love Lori, and Lori loves me. And we're one big happy family. <clears throat> but, for in him, who is he? Who is he? Jesus. Who is he? I think it's clear that the Apostle Paul here 
And I don't think there's, a, I'm not a theologian, so, you know, don't, don't say, you know, well, you know, theologian Campbell said, no, I'm not a theologian, I just love God. That's all, I just love the Lord. I just find him very attractive to me. I just find him to be my best friend. When I've been in some pretty bad situations, he has never let me down. He has never left me. And I've been in some pretty tight spots. But he has always been there for me every time. Oh, well, you know, Gordon, you don't know what I've been through. Well, you know what? You don't know what I've been through. <laughs> but he's been right there with me. Talk about Lori and I being joined at the head. Jesus and I are joined at the heart. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're joined at the heart. Mm -hmm. right. Amen. Right there. He loves me. I'm his friend. And I love him. And he's my friend. Mm -hmm. What an honor that was for Abraham to hear whenever God said, Abraham, my friend. Mm -hmm. What an honor. Mm -hmm. Aren't you yes. glad today mm -hmm. that you are a friend of God? Yes. Aren't you? Amen. Yes. Right. I just think I just yes. think that is a marvelous privilege. Marvelous privilege. Paul's talking about Jesus here. There's no doubt. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely no doubt in the world. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So when I referred to him recently in this moment of time that we're in right now, this special moment, and I said that whenever he was on the boat with his disciples, he was the God-man. Paul said in Colossians 2 and 9 that he was the God-man. That in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then we have to read verse 10. And you are. Can I use the word you instead of ye? Mm -hmm. Do I have your permission? Mm -hmm. Can, yeah. No, I yeah. mm -hmm. And you are. Mm -hmm. And you are. Paula, and you are. And you are. Paul? Lori, and you are complete in them. No. Mm -hmm. You are complete mm -hmm. in him. In him. In him. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And that's why he was able to say, peace be still. Mm -hmm. Knock it off. You're scared of my chums. This is not the time. He is the mighty God, mm -hmm. the everlasting Father, mm -hmm. the Prince of Peace, the Wonderful, the Counselor. He is God manifested in the flesh. There's a Christmas song was written in America by a fellow by the name of Mark Lowry. And it's called, uh, I think it's called uh, Mary. Uh, Mary. Mary Did You Know. Mary Did You Know. Mm -hmm. And inspired words in that song, probably one of my favorite Christmas songs. I love, Oh Come All You Faithful. I love, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. I love all of these things. But... Once in Royal David City. I love these songs. But, Mary, did you know? Did you know, Mary, that when you looked in the eyes of that baby, that you're looking at the eyes of God? You want to see what God looks like as a man? Look at Jesus. Jesus Christ was God manifest in 
So that brings me to the point where I can tell you what is going on in what's going on in Elgin. My father, when he was here, 1973, in 17A South Gilroy Street, up in the top row, they had just bought the place, they'd renovated it, it is a protected home to this day. Not much can be done except for the inside, but, and yesterday we got to go up into the attic room where he wrote the book. He wrote All the Fullness by David Campbell. This book was printed in 1975. It was uh, reprinted in 1983 after he died. And then it kind of went to sleep. And then in 2015, there was an awakening. A great awakening. A miracle took place. And ultimately in 2016, my mother and I were able to recapture the copyright from the original publishers. They gave us the right to publish and we were able to get the copyright. We were, went to the Library of Congress, uh, copyright in Washington, D.C. My wife and I went there, met the people there, and we actually saw the original three by five card from 1975 when the copyright was issued for the first time. Mm -hmm. Said right on there, all the phones by David Cameron, written in Elgin, Scotland. Think about that. So we were able to republish the book. I'd like to read a little bit from it, if you don't mind. <clears throat> Just a little okay. bit, not, not a lot, but I'd like to read a little bit from it. Because I want to encourage you, <clears throat> I want to encourage you to realize that God is at work in Elgin, right here. You're part of something that is a part of what God is doing. Chapter 1, there's a section in chapter 1 that is a subsection that says what the scriptures say. No student of the Bible would attempt to prove that the word of God ever states that there is more than one God. We, we think that pretty clearly, right? <coughs> Deuteronomy 6 and 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. End of story, right? You'll have no other gods beside me. You'll have no other gods before me. It's all very clear, clear, you know. So this is from the book written in Elgin by my father, built the church that you're sitting in today. No student of the Bible would attempt to prove that the word of God ever states that there is more than one God. Therefore, in this first chapter, I am on common ground with believers in the Trinity, even in the second chapter, when I take up the proposition that Jesus is God. Most all will agree with the majority of what I have to say. It is in the succeeding chapters that decision will present itself. But for now, let us look at a number of scriptures from different books of the Bible which prove that God is one. By way of introduction to these scriptures, I quote what C.H. Spurgeon said concerning Revelation 19 and 9, which reads in part, and he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Spurgeon said, If you believe that, these are the true sayings of God, you will listen to them with attention and judge what you hear from preachers by this infallible standard. You will receive these words with assurance. This will produce a confidence of understanding. This will produce rest of heart. You will submit with reverence to these words. You will proclaim it with boldness. We do well to remember this statement from Spurgeon as we approach together what the scriptures say. May God give us confidence of understanding and rest of heart as we proceed to investigate his word. In Isaiah 25, 1, we read, O Lord, thou art my God. I will exalt thee. I will praise thy name. In this passage, we see that the God of Isaiah was one God, for he says, I will exalt thee. I will also find his name was one, for Isaiah says, I will praise thy name. His singularity is thus well demonstrated. 
Let us remember that the Apostle Thomas, Doubting Thomas, had a similar revelation when, under divine inspiration, he uttered the words recorded in John 20, 28, My Lord and my God. Thomas uttered these words about Jesus, whereas Isaiah exclaimed them about the Jehovah God of the Old Testament. Whereas Thomas said, The Lord of me and the God of me, Isaiah said, O Lord, thou art my God. There is and has always been only one God. Both these men worshipped him. Not them. Him. So since this book was published, again, it has also been, and my dad liked technology, so he'd love to, to see this. I just read you that from this tablet. Mm -hmm. So it's Kindle. Mm -hmm. It's also available Kindle on Amazon.com worldwide. Now because it's available now worldwide, I want you to know, I want you to feel and know exactly what's going on. Because this book was written I believe under the inspiration of the Lord. I believe God worked it out for my dad to write it. I think it was right in the, the plan of the Lord. In the summer, whenever we got back in 1973 from America, my dad went to uh, West Germany, to Kaiserslautern, to uh, preach in some churches there. And one of the missionaries that was there, his name was N. Wayne Nye, after he heard my father preach on the oneness of God, he told him, he says, Brother Campbell, he said, I think you really, really ought to write a book on this. And so my dad came back to Elgin, South Gilbury Street, wrote the book, and now it's been republished. And just over the last 18 months, just in the last 18 months, something that came right out of the city of Elgin. This book is now being used as a textbook to teach the message of the oneness of God in Hong Kong, in Macau, in the United States of America, in the United Kingdom, in Zambia, in Zimbabwe, in Nigeria, in Kenya, in Tanzania, in Rwanda, in Uganda, in the DRC, Congo, in Botswana, in South Africa, and in Burundi. Over 130 pastors have received this book in Zambia alone. We are very grateful for God raising up Pastor Pax Patrick Chola in Lusaka, Zambia, 18 months ago, just recently. Actually, about a year ago now. Actually, in this December, we did a fundraiser because we had a pastor in Kenya who wanted to get the book to teach in his Bible school. So once we had raised the funds in January, we put in the order on Amazon, and the first 50 books were lost. Never made. So in March, we resubmitted another order. The second order was stolen. So then God brought us in, in contact with other people that were involved with missionary work in Kenya, and we found out that the postal system is completely corrupt, and if they figure that there's of anything from the United States coming of any value, they're just going to steal it. So this man, Patrick Chola from Lusaka, Zambia, decided that he was going to help us. So he volunteered to go on a 74-hour round-trip bus ride from Lusaka, Zambia to Kenya just to make sure that those books got to the pastor that was looking for them. And they just arrived in September. So whenever I think about the impact 
that Elgin Scott. Some people would say, well, why would your father come all the way from the south of England and bring his wife and his son in 1969? Why would he do that to come to Elgin, Scotland? He'd never been to Elgin, Scotland in his life. He came up one time, he met with the people, he felt something strong that the Lord wanted him to come here. But why did he come here? He came here because of his best friend. His best friend. His best friend talked to him and said, David, I need you to go and plant a one in Elgin Scotland. Because on November the 3rd, 2019, there's going to be some very special people sitting in that building. There's going to be some very special people standing in that building. There's going to be some very special people playing music in that building. There's going to be some very special people praising my name in that building. There's going to be some very special people in that building that are going to be praying and praising and reading my word and lifting up my name and saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for being my heavenly Father. Thank you for being my friend. Thank you for being my Savior. I still am staggered. I've got to tell you, I must end with this and say that I am still absolutely staggered that Jesus Christ died for me. I am I, I'm floored. See, I'm just not that good. I'm just not that good. So I am absolutely staggered that the God of creation, that the winds and the waves obey when he speaks, that same God of creation robed himself in human flesh and came here to die. You know, some people say, why did you come back to, did you come back to the UK? You're getting a bit older now, Gordon. Did you come back to the UK to die? No, I came back to the UK to live. <laughs> but Jesus came to this world to die. <clears throat> He didn't come here to live. He came here to die. Mm -hmm. for us. And he came here to die for me. Mm -hmm. For me. Greater love hath no man than this, that he would lay down his life mm -hmm. for a friend. But who would lay down their life for an enemy? I was an enemy of God. I was unrighteous. Paul says, my righteousness is filthy rags. Why would God robe himself in flesh and come and die for me? Well, that's because of who he is. That's because who is he? He's the creator. He is the great I am, the everlasting father, the prince of peace, the great eternal wonder. He is God manifest in flesh. We call him Jesus. We lift up his name. We praise him. We sing about him. We pray about him. But most of all, we love him. Most of all, he loves us. So if for some reason you're here today and you've never met him, may I have the privilege, may I have your permission to introduce you to my best friend. My best friend who's never let me down. He has never failed me yet. And the beautiful part about it is that he's not just my best friend. He wants to be yours he wants to love you. He wants to care for you. He wants to provide for you. He wants to help you. 
He wants to be your best friend. He will stick closer to you than a brother. He will never leave you or forsake you. Oh, I've heard all this nonsense before. I've heard it before. Well, in my life, it hasn't been nonsense. I personally am a strong man. I am a businessman. I ran dealerships in the United States, a very cutthroat business for 35 years. I'm a strong man. But when I am in the presence of God, I am on my knees. I'm hugging my father. You don't know how many times that we pray in our home and I've just said, Lord, I know you're here because I know he's here right now because mm -hmm. he said where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm there. He's here. My best mm -hmm. friend, I'm not having to stand up here all by myself. I'm not just talking words by myself. He's right here, Gordon. He's egging me on. He's telling me. He's saying, Gordon, come on. Come on, Gordon, tell him, tell him, tell him, tell him. Because I prayed and I said, Lord, if you just allow me to be a doorkeeper, that's all I'm interested in. I'd just like to open a door and say, if you've never met my friend, there he is. Here he is. And he loves you. And he died for you. And he gave his life for you. And he wants to be your best friend. Right now. Right now. You don't have to wait another moment. No. You don't have to wait another moment. You could just say, just as I am, without complaint. But that thy blood was shed for me, mm -hmm. and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, mm -hmm. I come. And I thank you so much for letting me be a part of your life today. I'm very grateful for that. It means so much to me. And I really am excited about coming back in about two or three weeks. And this, this, this place is just beautiful. Mm -hmm. It is really beautiful. I can't wait to see you all again. Mm -hmm. I just can't wait to have just more times of fellowship. Mm -hmm. By this shall all men know that you're my disciple. Mm -hmm. If you have love one for another, I love you. Mm -hmm. I love you. Thank you for letting Lori and myself spend this time with you today. This is an honor. It's a great privilege for me. And all I can say is, if you've never met him, this is your chance. Because he loves you. He loves you. Would you like to pray with me for just a moment? Would you mind doing that? Would you like to pray? I'd like, like to just tell you I love him. I'd just like to thank you. I'd just like to thank you. Lord, I just thank you, Jesus. I know who you are. You are God manifested in the flesh. You came and dwelt among us. You gave your life for me. And I will be eternally grateful. I was a mess. I was broken. My life was in tatters. And you very kindly, you put it all back together again. And thank you for that, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for giving me the privilege to be able to talk here today. And I thank you, Lord, for these very kind and loving and patient folk that are willing to listen to what we have to say. I thank you, Lord, for your anointing, Lord. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for it all. I give you all the praise. I give you all the honor. I give you all the glory. And I want you, Lord, if you will, right now, to just touch someone's heart right now, sitting under the sound of my voice and in your presence. Let their life with you begin today. Let them understand that what's in the past is in the past, mm -hmm. but that you've got a great and marvelous future for them. Yes. You are the great I am, the everlasting Father.
we sing about wants and we talk about and we pray to wants to answer your prayer this morning. And I'm here to tell you today that if you have a need that you would like God to help you with, He's only too willing to step into your situation and step into the picture. Several years ago, many years ago, most of you know this story, but those of you that don't, I want to share a little bit about how powerful our God is. Because sometimes you think, oh, that's just these are just stories and people tell uh, read things from the Bible and you think, well, how is that relevant to me today? But I want to tell you about this Jesus that has everything in his hands and everything that we need, we can find in him. In the year in December of 2002, I was given a diagnosis that nobody wants to hear. Nobody wants to hear that they have a terminal disease. And I was given a diagnosis that that, that I had stage three cancer and I was moving quickly towards stage four. And it's not something that a young man of 32 years old wants to hear. You want to hear that you're a big strapping lad and that you're all good, but you know what? That's not the news that I was given. I was told that, that I needed a miracle. I needed something to take place in my body that, 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 would, that, that would change my situation. And can I tell you folks, I didn't turn to people. I didn't turn to specialists. I didn't turn to, to people. Do you know who I turned to? I turned to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I turned to the healer of all diseases. I turned to the great physician because I knew that he was my hope. I knew that if I was going to have any kind of healing, God was going to orchestrate it. He was going to step into the picture. Amen. He was going to guide the hands and the minds of the medical professional. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe in the medical professional. I'm, I work, everybody knows, I work in the nursing industry. And I love it. I, I, I love helping people. I love doing what I do. But I'm telling you what, I know the healer today. I know the great physician. And I know when man says no, there is a man that says yes. I know when all situations around us are saying no, it's an impossibility. There's a Jesus that can step into your situation. Amen. And change every aspect of it. And so we begin to call upon the name of the Lord. We begin to call, amen, and we begin to pray, and we begin to seek God, and amen, I begin to throw myself into the Word of God, and God began to open up doors and revelation, amen, of who He was and exactly what He was capable of. I was 32 years old when I was given that, and I can look that here right before you. I am 51 years old. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm a pretty good for it, but I am 51 <laughs> years old. That means I have made it. Folks, yes. that was 2002. This is 2019. There has never, ever, ever been a single regression with that sickness. Because you know what? I know a healer. He does all things well. He, yes. he does Amen. a work. He does a complete work. When that yes. veil in the Amen. temple was rent, there was no Amen. thread, folks. There was no thread that was still left attached. That it was a complete work, and I'm here to tell you yes. that if you've got a need in your life, I've got a God that can take care of that. Even if you've yes. got a situation that you want to help you with, that. I know the man who wants to step in. Let me tell you who Jesus Amen. is, folks. He's the King of Kings and the Lord, Lord of Lords. And so this might be a little bit out of our comfort zone this morning, but that's all right. There's nobody yes. here but us. Right. <laughs> There's nobody here but us. And if you're a little bit out of your comfort zone, that's okay. That's okay. Because let me tell you something. If you will give that need to God in however you want to do it, whether you want to scream and holler at the top of your voice, whether you want to kneel, whether you want to sit, whether you just want to tell it from your heart, but however you want to do it this morning, yes. would you say, Jesus, you know I have this situation going on. And they're telling me that you can take would, would you would you try it any folks? Would you try would you ask God to step in to whatever you have going on? Would you try him today? Would you would you give him the opportunity to show himself who he is? Yes. And what he is capable of. And if you'd like for us to pray for you today, I want to encourage you to come to the front and we will pray for you. We will pray with you, man, that God will change your situation, that God will turn it around. 